Maize farming in South Africa. So more than 10 million tons of maize grain is produced in South Africa annually on approximately 3.1 million hectares of land, known as ha. Half of the production consists of white maize for human food consumption and maize needs 450 to 600 millimeters of rainfall per season, which is mainly acquired from the soil moisture reserves. The challenges in maize production include variations in environmental and climatic conditions, poor soils, labor issues, and yo, yo, yielding. That's what I was going to say. Yo, imagine that. What kind of geography teacher are you listening to right now? Low yielding seeds, among others. That's actually called a spoonerism, if you guys didn't know. I don't think they asked that in the English paper one this year. Okay, so let's get to the video. 2.3.1, name the main maize producing province in South Africa. So if you look very carefully, the answer is going to be A here. But which province is that? That's Gauteng. That's KZN. There's Lesotho here. There's Swaziland. Mpumalanga. Freestart. I'm currently in Free State right now. I'm in Clarence on a little holiday presenting this video while you guys are preparing for your final examinations. Well, depending on when you are watching this video. But yeah, the answer here is going to be Free State. 2.3.2, refer to the graph, compare the amount of maize produced to the amount that is exported. So if you look very carefully, dot, 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 there's always more produced than exported, which is a good thing for the most part. 2.3.3, why does South Africa have a large domestic or local market for maize? Well, it's a staple food among South Africans, so it's a staple and it's cheap as well. It's, it's affordable, it's zero rated goods. It's accessible, um, it's available to those on the lower end of the income spectrum. Um, anything along those lines that have scored you the mark. 2.3.4, how will climatic factors reduce maize production? Well, there are some major answers here. If you guys just look on the right, um, I'll give you three. So the growth of crops is stunted, so just kind of halts or just stops. It's not as smooth as it should be. Crops will be washed away. Uh, crops will be destroyed, damaged, or they could dry out. Oh, well, they could be burned. Okay, anything regarding climate factors there would have scored you the marks. 2.3.5. Explain the economic importance of maize production to the South African economy. So the export of maize, firstly, it brings in Forex, foreign currency. That actually stands for foreign exchange. Let's just go with foreign currency. There's a large domestic market for maize. So large domestic market, number three. Uh, maize is used as a raw material in the secondary economic sector um, and I think the most important one, it's a significant contribution to GDP, gross domestic product. Massive. Pretty large question here. Eitenhag and their industrial re region. We've got like an article here. We've got a map. We've got a timeline. Yeah, no, there's a lot going on. I can't lie to you. So while the automotive sector continues to dominate, the Kucha industrial development zone holds the key to expanding and diversification of the industries of the Port Elizabeth Eitenhag core industrial region. The long-term presence of VW, Volkswagen, and Isuzu, Isuzu has been uplifted by a multi-phase 11 billion rand investment by the Beijing Automotive Group. Beijing is in China. And we've got a map of PE here and Eitenhag, and we've got a timeline of Kucha-related newspaper headlines just to give you a bit of a feel of what they are, what they're all about. So we've got a solar cell factory opening here. We've got aquaculture, a fish farm zone. And now finally, the Capes Kucha, Eastern Capes Kucha begins to attract uh, investments. And just bits and pieces about projects, uh, new companies and their investments, gas power. Yeah, you guys can uh, feel free to pause the video and you can just have a look at it. So 2.4.1, name the type of transport infrastructure indicated on the map, which favors the location of the Port Elizabeth Eitenhag core industrial region look very carefully at the diagram the answer here is going to be harbor the primary or secondary sector dominates the economy of the pe Eitenhag core industrial region the answer here is going to be secondary 2.4.3 name one major company in the extract that has invested in the port elizabeth Eitenhag core industrial region port elizabeth these days it's called obeja you i hope i pronounced that correctly hey i i was practicing before the video obeja Obeja. Yo, guys, I'm trying my best here, hey? 
or 2.4.3. Um, anything along the lines of Volkswagen, Isuzu, uh, the Beijing Automotive Group, all of that would have been fine for 2.4.3. 2.4.4, quote two headlines from the timeline of the Kucha related newspaper headlines to show that diversification of industries is taking place. So with 2.4.4, the headlines that we can look at here, the solar cell factory is opening, aquaculture has new fish farm uh, zone progresses, and the new 10,000 megawatt gas power plan. Anything along those lines to show the diversi diversification of industries is taking place. 2.4.5, how would this diversification of industries benefit the labor force? I'm not going to say it again. Yo, how many times uh, in this industrial region? So uh, any two answers here would have been fine with a decent elaboration. So there's just greater employment opportunity. And not only is there greater employment opportunity, there's a variety of jobs available. So people now have options. They can choose to filter into the different sectors. Also, anything along these lines would have scored you the marks. The labor force is exposed to a variety of skills, upskilling of labor, job creation of opportunities, of migration of skilled labor. So people coming into this area uh, nationally and maybe internationally to transfer their skills and just overall the improved quality of life um, and also the multiplier effect. You know, money makes money in this region. And 2.4.6, last question here. Explain why the Kucha Industrial Development Zone would be an attractive location for investment by overseas companies. So any of these answers would be fine. Just have a look here. The deep water harbor can handle large container ships. So the harbor can handle large, large, yo, why am I sounding like I'm American now? Large, large ships. That's my like Durban accent coming through. From Durbs, living in Josie, studied in the Western Cape, Vescarp. So I'm here. I don't ever like to, uh, you know, name, uh, name my universities or high schools and things like that. I keep it under wraps, keep it confidential. Okay, let's get back to the question. <laughs> I'm, try I'm trying to act too cool here, guys. I'm trying to act too cool. No, I'm just, I'm just joking. I'm playing. Protect my safety, you know? Stalkers. <laughs> I'm getting famous. I'm just joking. This is, like, at the time of making, I've got, like, 350 subs. We can just, we can just keep it like that. I'm doing this for the metrics of 2024. Uh, also, regarding this deep water harbor, uh, it facilitates the export of goods. So, facilitates the export of goods. And um, also anything along these lines here for your third answer. Uh, there are large tracts of available land for construction of industry or specialized industry. There's well-developed infrastructure to other parts of South Africa. Uh, further, the zone provides incentives uh, which encourage overseas industries. Okay, anything along those lines would have scored you the mark. I, I love saying anything along those lines. I don't know. It just sounds so posh. Instead of me saying, hey, you, you say this, it's fine. <laughs> you know what I mean? Along along these lines, I sound like an academic. You know what I mean? I try to keep my lessons cool and all that. You know, use different colors, keep it formal, take time preparing the PowerPoints. But uh, yeah, sometimes I just, I need to just say it quickly rather than saying it professionally. Let's have a look at 2.5. Refer to the extract and graph on the informal sector below. So here's our... Graph, a hey, number two, man, come on, Greece is beating us. I, I don't even know what this is. No, I'm joking. It's the informal sector percentage. Uh, the vast majority of informal sector operators, 73%, earn well below the income tax, personal tax paid to the government threshold of 79,000 rands per annum, uh, set by SARS, the big tax guys, the South African Revenue Services. 73%. In addition, many informal sector workers, particularly those in retail, pay VAT tax paid for goods purchased. Isn't that so crazy that the vast majority of informal um, vendors, they don't pay tax, but yet that is the greatest amount. Like it is the biggest part of the population that requires services from the government in terms of healthcare, especially. They don't pay tax, but they utilize government services. Like, I mean, I'm not throwing shade on anyone here. I'm just saying these are fundamental issues um, that we have in South Africa. Tax-paying citizens don't make use of public services because, well, for the most part, they are inadequate. They don't function properly. I mean, as you guys know, in South Africa, like, you can go to pretty much any kind of government establishment and something will be, like, offline, you know? 
Like, I mean, you've been to home affairs, you know, you go to the front of the queue, you know, you're all ready to make your ID, your passport, maybe you're traveling in a month, system is offline. They tell you, come again tomorrow, wait seven hours, whatever. It's heavy. It's like, it's really heavy being South African. So, I mean, if you are fortunate enough to, you know, be able to afford like medical aid or just like fancier healthcare, anything that's private, you can go see a physio or dentist. Yeah, it's a major, major privilege. Okay, so uh, where were we? However, unlike their counterparts in the formal sector, they are not able to claim these amounts back from the tax authorities. Permits allow people to trade legally. However, the legal requirement of encouraging informal traders to obtain permits has been met with reluctance, not wanting, you know, in, in case you didn't know what reluctance meant. Um, I mean, there's a lot of individuals in this country who don't speak English as the home language but have to do the subject um, in English because it's only available in English and Afrikaans. The informal sector is worth supporting because it makes up a large part of the workforce. Further, while earnings are often very low in the informal sector, this type of employment is particularly important in keeping households above the poverty line. Okay, so 2.5.1, let's answer some questions. According to the graph, what percentage of South Africa's population is classified as the informal sector? Quick answer here, it's 20%. 2.5.2, give economic reasons that have led to such a large informal sector in South Africa. Two quick ones where we face major economic recessions and we've got really high levels of unemployment. It's also less expensive, it's accessible, you make use of informal laborers, non-payment of additional costs, anything along those lines that have scored you the marks. 2.5.3, explain the economic importance of the informal sector. So firstly, most importantly, they provide, provide, <laughs> they provide employment opportunities. Uh, second, it reduces government responsibility for providing grants. So it reduces the responsibility of government having to provide these grants with, you know, SASA, those 350 grants that we had in COVID uh, and all the illegal stuff that went with it. You know, people scamming SASA, imagine that. And 2.5.4, uh, this is a cracker that all you geo students are ever so familiar with, the eight-line question. In a paragraph of approximately eight lines, suggest strategies that could be implemented to improve the informal sector. Now, these are the questions, guys, that tend to separate your distinction candidates from your 60 and 70 percenters. It's the questions where now you can differentiate yourself and nail down your distinction. So if you're, stra if you're straddling like 70, 80 percent and you want to consolidate that 80% mark, um, these are the questions in which you do it in. And also, if you're just looking to pass a geo, this is where you need to score minimum three or four marks out of eight. You can't just lose everything here. So let me just draw a line here, and we need to give four possible answers with a relatively good substantiation. So firstly, we need to regulate the sector. And also, if you just gave an example here, it would be accepted. The memo is relatively broad for questions like this. We need to allocate designated areas for trade. So allocate areas for trade, supply basic services, the most basic of services, you know, just food, water, some level of shelter and provide infrastructure. Other accepted answers, increase security for goods, create partnerships with the private sector, upskill entrepreneurs. And yeah, if you listed anything along these lines, you would have scored um, all the marks and you're on your way to scoring eight out of eight.